That was Bob and the Blues, Black Feather. Hi, welcome to Rockdown. I'm Wendy Stapleton, and tonight my guest is by far one of the best voices in Australian rock. Would you please welcome Mr. Neil Johns? Oh, thank you. How are you? <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes, nice. You're welcome. It's true. Um, Black Feather mm. formed way back in 1970 really. yeah. in Sydney. Yes. Can Sydney. you tell me how you came to join? Well, you didn't join. You actually sort of founded. The band. Well, I guess it was, was like that. What, what originally happened was there was a band called the Dave Miller Set, mm -hmm. and it was uh, it, they approached me at a, at a venue one night, and they were obviously having problems with Dave Miller, or Dave Miller was having problems with them, or whatever, and they decided they needed a new singer, and that happened to be me. How did they find you? Um, I think I was performing at uh, Caesar's Inn Place in Sydney, which was a, a notorious venue in there. And um, I think the bass player and the drummer came along, and uh, which was Leith Corbett, and, but the bass player. And they came along and uh, just watched the band and sort of thought, I think maybe we should get that young guy. And young you were. You were a lot younger than the other guys. Yeah, at that time I was 17. So, wow. And um, by the time Seasons of Change and, and that Mountains of Madness and Blackfeather had started, it was 1970. So, But it didn't get released until 1971. You were... Uh as, as a younger boy, were more a jazz, jazz. I started, singer? yeah. I started, I started like a lot of people do, but I never, I never did covers, which intrigues a lot of people. So I started, I started touring when I was thirteen, in a, in a band that was called the Future MBEs, which was quite bizarre. That's that's. The quite singer was twelve. I wasn't the singer. I was the bass player because there was a there was a, a a spot came up for a bass player, and I went and got, I talked my dad into getting me a bass, and I got the four free lessons with the bass that you got, and got the gig. And um, Where did you tour? At 13? Oh, we did Canberra. Actually, I think we did something in Melbourne, but I can't remember where it was, because it was so long ago. But it was just local and, and inter, not interstate, but further in intrastate. So really, by the time you were... I started doing jazz clubs. when I was 15. Mm, you were experienced. They thought I was a girl, time. actually. I think that's why I got into the clubs. You know, because I had long, I, at that stage I had long hair, you know, really long hair, and, and I looked like a girl, I guess so. Because if they knew how old I was, it wasn't, I wasn't supposed to be there. Because they were licensed, they were wine bars and things. So what did they think when you opened your mouth? Oh, oh it always went well. I was always playing with guys that were in there. I mean, you didn't sound like a girl. No. Oh, well, maybe I did then. I don't know. <laughs> it was, I was young, so maybe my voice was a bit... I was, I've always been one to go for an upper range anyway. You know, I like that well, you do have a magnificent voice. Okay, back to Black Feather. So you were the baby of the group. Mm. And I've always, well, my favourite song, and um, I always go back to this, I used to go to this place in Melbourne called Sebastian's. Yes. For the simple reason that you could get in, mm. which I've said yeah, I loved to lots of people period. before. There were great venues there where you didn't have to be 18 to get in because they weren't licensed anyway. Mm. So mm. it was a great opportunity to see bands. Um, seasons of Change. Mm. Was my absolute, absolute yeah. favourite, and it was it was such an unusual. The melody had a lot to do. John Robinson was the main instigator of that song. I mean, he got the melody, and it was all new to me because I was new in the studio and everything like that. Whereas John had been in and out with the Dave Miller set quite a lot, and he had a lot of experience. And it was his first realm into writing parts for string sections, so he he had to do a crash course and how to do that, and and they all. We used the Sydney Symphony Orchestra string section, um, and and they loved what John had done, and John just sort of left it, you know. We just did, we tossed around with a lyrical thing. John came up with a lot of the lyrics in the in the verses and things, which I didn't quite understand what the what the subject matter was at the time. I was it was quite amusing to me. I thought, mm, okay, so it, it was, was deep. It was deep. But the chorus, he, he threw the he said, you know, you come up with anything you can think of with the chorus, you know. So so I sort of did the chorus, and we just went on from there and. Yeah, it's a great song, yeah. It's still, a great I still song. love it. Yeah, I love it. I think it. a lot of people do. Yeah, I mean, you hear that, it actually takes you right back to a certain time. Um, okay, then moving on, uh, I've noticed that Black Feather has just evolved and evolved and evolved. It's never actually stopped, has it? No, it hasn't actually. I mean, there's been, there was a period where I think people thought I was dead. But there was a period where I just stepped out of the, the industry for a while. Well, it appeared that I stepped out of the industry. I stepped out of the limelight, I guess, so to speak, which was, when I, when I think back on it, probably a big mistake in retrospect because it, it, it's something that you're not allowed to do, really. You can't really step away from something and come back. Sometimes you have to, though. 
Yeah, look, were I was you, always singing though. I, did I, you feel burned out or did no, you no, feel, no. were you disenchanted? Yeah, I just didn't like the industry. I didn't think the industry was a, a reality anymore because there was a period just after, I think just after the Bob and the Blues period in the uh, early 70s where there was a dictatorship came into the music industry where you were told, I'm, I, look, I've got a great story. I, I should tell it. Yeah, I, please, I, don't, if, I won't name names though, but um, my, somebody in very high up in the industry, uh, made, a, made a comment to me um, after a gig one night. And at, at this stage, Bop and the Blues had been number one for about eight weeks. And they were saying to me, um, look, if you want to really crack it, you know, maybe you should think about doing this. Have you seen John English? You know, you've seen how John does cartwheels and things like that. And, and, it, and I was thinking, yeah. And, and, but I, and then they go, well, what about, and have you seen such and such a band? Because the English band started to really come out quite a lot by that stage. And I think Satin was started come on, starting to come onto the scene as well. And they were talking about maybe, have you thought about wearing this and wearing that? And, and after, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking and I'm going, okay, this person's telling me that I should do this and this and this to get to the top. And I'm thinking, I've got it. I'm in a band that's got a song that's been number one for eight weeks. So it went for 13, and it was. And he's telling me how to how to, to do, do it. To do cartwheels. Well, how to do it to get there. And it's kind. Of, I, I would have thought a better analogy would have been. Uh, have you thought about longevity? Have you thought about? You know, I would have under, understood that statement. I would have gone. Oh yeah, I've thought about it. But then my, I would turn around and go. But then again, I I. I think of bands like the Eagles and things like that and, and all these things that I'm into and I don't see that. I don't see cartwheels. I, I, yeah. hear, I hear fantastic melodies and fantastic voices and that's all that, that peop those people want. It's heartbreaking. We'll take a short break and be back soon. Thank you. Red ship sailing amongst the cloud Mounts the snow Still it's cold Welcome back to Rockdown. My special guest is Neil Johns, lead singer from Black Feather. We're having a great old chat here about the good old days. The good old, um, bad old days, only yes. bad in as much as... The business side. The business side for everyone. Everyone I speak to it seems to have a rather sort of <laughs> bleak view of that side of things because, of course, no one made any money. Mm. Did, I mean, it was just virtually impossible. Yeah, it was surprising. I mean, I, the, an area that I looked at, because I was surprised later, and I did discover something 10 years after the fact that the, it, by that stage you didn't have a enough money to sort of take it to court. But I had worked out that at one stage we were earning about 14000 a week and um, we were all on a wage, <coughs> I think, of 300 It doesn't sound like a lot, but in those days that was a lot of money. Sounds like a lot to me. And Which was good because so we were buying clothes, going to lunch, going, we were doing the lifestyle thing. There was enough money for that. But there was also, see, I think in the business aspect back in those days, um, those that were controlling the industry strings were, had worked out that we loved what we did, yeah. number one. And I don't know about yourself, but with the, with the male gender, which there were predominantly more of, yeah. unfortunately, um, the, there was a way around that. I mean, there were a lot of, a lot of substance abuse in those days, although I didn't... in, in my realm of friends, I didn't see extreme substance abuse, but so I find it funny that I'm actually using that terminology, substance abuse, but anyway. <laughs> but Being politically correct there, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe. Um, but the thing is, it was a, a period when um, they realised that as long as they were happy, as long as the act was happy, and that involved... Uh, the opposite gender sometimes. They'd, there was a few people... Sex, drugs and rock and roll. Yeah, it really yeah, was it sex, was drugs that, and yeah. roll. And they realised that they could control us in that aspect and, 
and whenever you went to the, the great round table meetings and would demand to know, look, what is happening? What's happening financially? You know, what's going on? Oh, uh, uh, then the substance would, there'd be certain substances would come out in the, in the pursuit of that. And that, then you'd forget what you went in there for. And then probably they'd bring someone from the opposite gender in to sort of, just to change the mood of the room. And I think that was a technique used by a, a, a couple of major people in this industry. Yeah. <laughs> See, I guess these days you, you probably wouldn't ever even go into the meeting. You have people go and do that for you. Lawyers and... Yeah. I people guess like so. that, but apart from that side of things, too, uh, production started to become a really important factor in in your show. Yes, um, people were always wanting to get bigger yes. systems. Yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah. Uh, I think because it, it actually started to happen that, especially with PAs, and not necessarily lighting so much, because you had lighting companies at that time, like LSD in Sydney. It was LSD lights. I'm I'm not sure what the main one was down here, uh, but there were these companies that were involved in mo most of the big shows, mm. and they did the lights. Uh, but PAs were, of course, column, the infamous columns with speakers. And actually, that's an area where I learnt how, how to project because I'd gone from jazz into a band with the loudest guitarist in the country, <laughs> about a six hundred watt guitar, and of course, inevitably the PA was a six hundred watt PA. So it was competition time. So you had to really learn how to push your voice to extremes. But, but getting back to that, but we were one of the first bands to have a three-way PA. I don't, I, know, I don't know if everybody knows what a three-way PA is. Well, it's big and, yeah. and you and, need a truck. And, and yeah, and then we, we were one of the first bands to move out of the famous uh, dual-wheel transit zone into a, an actual truck. So this is, this is where all your money gets eaten up as well? It does, it? yeah. But I don't know what happened to that truck or PA, by the way. Did <laughs> because, you buy it? No. Well, obviously, maybe we did buy it, but we didn't know that we'd bought it. You could have bought it. No, I think you could we have did bought buy it about it. ten times over. Yeah, more than likely, yes. So yeah, it was sad, actually. It was in retrospect when it came to an end, you found yourself with no money in the bank. Well, you, you know, everyone, everyone I speak to says the same thing. So um, obviously, that was just what tended to happen. Um, you would have been probably really old by then, nineteen. Um, yes, all well, 19, yeah, by, by Bop on the Blues, I was 19, yeah. You were saying that someone actually told you you were a has-been yeah, at the age it was of it, 19. Yeah, it was an, an intriguing, um, see, these are the, the same people that were controlling the uh, the industry to speak in this country, and I, I think about the lack of insight and the lack of intelligence in, in, that, in that way to look at someone so young that's really just starting out and they haven't even delved into the possibilities of this and, and plenty of other people as well because a lot of young people around are not looking as an American manager for instance would look at the, the, the big picture. Nearly every band went to England. They did. Mine was an accident. Was it? Because and it was much later in the piece. It was 1976 and it was T-Rex. Oh really? So and it was, it was because actually Con Gallon from Gallon's Guitars was, was actually involved as a guitar tech, I think, for Mark Bolan in some European tours. And he'd come back to Australia and I'd met him up in Sydney um, when I was in a band called Feather, which was a, because of a legality. It's another bizarre thing. You couldn't use your name because someone else had cooked it. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, he, he was talking about this thing and then he went back over to England and then I, I got a phone call uh, I've got to tell you, I wasn't a real fan of, of T Rex. So I was very into American music and right. uh, like blues and, and West Coast and stuff like that. Uh, and they said, look, you know, they're after a singer. And I, of course, opportunity knocks. So I went. But uh, timing being everything in this industry, I was there when the Sex Pistols started. So, so, <laughs> I, so I was there for 12 months and then had to come home because I uh, didn't have orange hair and, yeah, yeah. and didn't abuse people you weren't and a stuff. Punk. No, I wasn't a punk. <laughs> I, was a, I was a lover. <laughs> oh, look, oh yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame you didn't make it to the States. But anyway, we'll take a break. Yep. Be back really soon. Thank you. Rock down. Welcome back to Rock Down. My special guest is Neil Johns from Blackfeather. Now, what are we up to today? Well, Blackfeather's still performing. Um, yes. Not as much as I'd like to see them performing. Um, we haven't, so we've recorded a live. CD. It was going to be a DVD, but um, 
for those in television land would know there was a flaring issue with my white shirt that we couldn't because we we had five cameras but one they weren't all manned. Where did you do this? Did it capers. Fantastic. So, uh, but the sound was great. So we decided to release it as a live CD. But keep the footage. We we thought we'd perhaps include the footage as a freebie, so people could have that as well. Um, but uh, we are working on a DVD as well. Yeah. So it's because we've got some new footage, and we might take footage from the new one and the capers and intertwine them and make a DVD from that. So is it new material? It is all new material. Oh, no, we include, of course, seasons. Yes. Actually, for the first time ever, I think, with Black Feather coming up, we have included about five uh, Black Feather songs, including an old uh, Little Richard standard, which was uh, Slippin' and Slidin', yeah. which is, was the follow-up to Bop and the Blues, but uh, the record company didn't get behind it. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, it's a predominantly new. Um, and I, I think you have a song that you'll be using today that's uh, uh, my personal favourite. I mean, I've predominantly written most of them. There are a few with Brendan as well, Brendan Mason being the guitarist. Uh, and, and of course, Bre Brendan Mason yeah, and, and, and Kerry McKenna, the bass player, are both from Matter Lake. Actually, what another. And, and the drummer is uh, Mick Holden, who was with uh, Hot City Bump Band. Wow, yes, um, I know Mick. He was in the mixtures at one stage, I believe, also. It's a great lineup, and and Daryl Roberts has been playing keys with us a lot, and Daryl's uh, with Hey Gringo and also with Spectrum. Yes, absolutely. So uh, you've got a website. Well, we have yes, we have our MySpace site. Our website has, still hasn't come up yet. <laughs> we're a bit we're a bit slow behind the eight ball. So <laughs> we were talking about this before. I don't know how to change mine. Um, we need help. Yeah, we need help. We need help. <laughs> if anyone can help us, yeah. that'd be great. Yeah, actually, it would be fantastic. It would be really good. Um, Okay, so you've got your MySpace. Yes. Which is? Uh, it's, well, I guess everyone knows that, well, www.myspace.com backwards slash, I believe, uh, Blackfeather 2. Now, the two, Blackfeather 2. Yeah, perhaps there was a reason. There is a company in America that's the, an Indian company that sells product, and I think they might have Blackfeather, so we have right. to go for two. Uh, Neil, thank you very much for coming on. Thank it's you. been my pleasure. Oh. We're going to take the show out tonight with a, a live version of a song called? Too Many Times. Too Many Times. I'm Wendy Stapleton. See you next week on Rockdown.